Good afternoon and um, welcome to the donor education series being hosted by the Missoula Community Foundation. The foundation works um, to be a connector, educator and funder um, in Missoula. The foundation's recent expansion has been the ability to manage funds for our donors. My name is Marcy Allen. I'm the executive director of the foundation. Our mission is to enhance community vitality by inspiring community giving and strengthening nonprofits. We hope that this education series serves as a way to increase awareness about philanthropy in our community. Now, it's my um, pleasure to introduce our speaker today. I would like to welcome Dr. Marcia Getting. Dr. Getting is a professor um, and an extension family economic specialist at Montana State University in Bozeman. Um, from 2016 to 2020, she has presented over 220 financial and estate planning programs reaching over 10,000 Montanans. She has received state, regional, and national awards um, for her programs. She received in 2017 the Western Region Excellence in Extension Award from Cooperative Extension and the National Institute of Food and Agriculture and the Association of Public and Land Granting Universities. During the pandemic, um, uh, in 2020, she provided Tuesday tip webinars and again in 2021 with a total of 3,400 participants. When the pandemic continued in 2021, um, she offered webinars with new estate planning topics during Mont Guide Mondays and what, when, when, I can't even say it, Marcia. Wisdom. Wisdom, Wisdom Wednesdays. Wednesdays. <laughs> like a tongue twister. Um, in collaboration with the AARP of Montana, and Thoughtful Thursdays in collaboration with Montana State University Alumni Foundation. Webinars that totaled over a thousand participants. So we're really excited to have Marcia here. I do wanna go over a few um, Zoom etiquette um, things. Um, if you could please turn off your volume um, and your video. However, if you feel inclined, you may turn on your video. Um, and if you have questions at any point during the presentation, please use them in the chat. If they're relevant to the current topic, I will um, help uh, Marcia identify those questions and ask them. If not, we may save them for the questions and answers afterwards. Um, please note that the event is being recorded and we will share this with donors who are not able to attend today on our YouTube channel. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Marcia. Well, thank you very much, Marcy, and I'm honored to be asked by the Montana, or uh, well, the Missoula Community Foundation, uh, and the topic that we thought we'd take a look at today is who gets your property if you die without writing a will or if you don't have a trust, because that's something I found that is a, a lot of interest out there. And one of the things is I want to promote, of course, that I'm with Montana State University. I realized you have another university there in Missoula, and I have worked real closely with the, the school of law that's there. And so we, we get along really well, maybe better than the Bobcat and the Grizz do. Uh, now, Marcy, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to meet her, but one of the things that she re requested is that as a result of what I present, that you will get enthusiastic about doing some estate planning. And then the next thing is um, Marcy would like for me to get you motivated to get your will written. So that's one of the things I want to do. And then she said, and by the way, don't forget that you're on over the noon hour. So don't be dull uh, that you put people to sleep while they're trying to eat their lunch. So, right, I've got a lot of things that I have to do to keep your attention during this thing. So if you brought your lunch along, great, go ahead and chomp away while I share some information. Now, one of the things that's happened with webinars is if you have participated in the past, maybe you've discovered like I have, that sometimes they can be boring and yeah, you have a hard time keeping away. So I've come up with some participant engagement tools that I hope will help with that. Now, one of them is using wildflower names as reminders of some of the things I'm talking about. And as you can tell by my office here at home, I am surrounded by wildflowers because that has become my favorite hobby to do in the summertime. 
And really, I hope that some of the names will just help you remember, now get this, why dying without a will is not the way to go. Uh, I hope a couple of you laughed at that one, but if not, that's okay. I'll try to be better later. So one of the questions that I have is, when did you last review your estate plan? Now, has it been this year or last year during the COVID stay? Uh, one to two years ago, you know, three to five, six to 10, or is it that you really don't have an estate plan? So what you do is you put down your sandwich for a second and you click on one of these and it'll give me a sense of what kinds of things I need to be emphasizing. Okay. Okay, I think we've got enough uh, participation here to see. So, uh, Kristen, you want to end the poll? Or I can. I discovered I have it. So, let's look at this results. Well, we see that 40% uh, of you looked within the last couple of years. Uh, some has been three to five. And, oh, my goodness, there's been some more than uh, 10 years ago. And that might indicate there's time for an update here, or at least look at it, because have there been changes in your family situation? But then we also have some that say, well, they don't have an estate plan. Oh, that's so wrong. Because you do. It's the law of interstate secession that Montana has for you. So we want to take a look at that. The other thing is the opportunity to ask your questions in the chat room. Uh, I find that sometimes uh, it's really helpful if I'm talking away and it's not clear that's where you put a note in the, the chat room to ask me about that. Now, here we have a beautiful flower. I love it. It's one that you find almost every May in Yellowstone National Park before the crowds get there. And it's called a steer's head. So what I'm wanting to do is steer you to an awareness of Montana's plan for the distribution of your property. After you die, it's going to go somewhere. Wouldn't you like to be control over that? Because you're the one that worked so hard to get where you're at today. So let's take a look at uh, the bitterroot, okay? And you all know this is Montana state flower, but what it reminds me of is the bitterness that can result in families from lack of planning. Because what you're doing is you're letting Montana interstate secession laws take over instead of doing it yourself. So let's see what happens to a family. Here we have mom and dad, and mom and dad have kids. The kids get married, and then the kids bless them with grandchildren. So in the 70s, this is a very happy family. Things are going very well. But then we get into later in life, and we discover there's some things that start happening. We have a son here uh, in western Montana, and he died as a result of an airplane crash. Then we had the daughter pass away in 2005 as a result of a car accident. Then dad is the one that passes away. So what we have here is mom, the grandma, the wife. She's the survivor. She has all the property in her name, but she doesn't write a will. So that's really sad on my part because I know what's going to happen. But I want to ask you, what we have here is grandchild D. And pretty soon we're gonna have a poll that's pulled up, but I want you to memorize this, although I've got a smaller version on it next. But I wanna know what fraction is this grandchild going to receive as a result of grandma dying without writing a will? Is that grandchild going to receive nothing? One sixth, one eighth, or one ninth? So again, put down the sandwich and give me what you think is going to happen with your, or in this case, grandma's property. Grandchild receiving nothing. I got three votes on that. And it looks like we only, okay, we do have five participants, but we'll go with the three. And in the poll, Okay, so now what we've got is the percentages. And 75% of you said nothing. Well, I think you're a little on the mean side, don't you? 
I mean, you're not going to give the grandchild anything. And then we have one person that said 25%. And guess what? That person is the one that got it right. So you can sit there at your computer and go, yay, 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 you got it right. Good for you. Because what you might know is a term that Montana uses, and that's called right of representation. So what does that mean? Well, we take a look at mom and dad or grandma and grandpa, and we look and ask, how many children did you have? And in this case, they had three. So we look at it and say, well, each generation is going to take the share their parent would have received. So how does that work? Well, we've got the blue grandchild over here and that grandchild is going to receive a third because that's the amount that the son would have received had the son lived. So you see what Montana does is recognize bloodlines, okay? So the wife in this case doesn't get any of the property at all. It goes to the grandchild. Now, look at those two pink grandchildren. Well, how would you like to be them and explaining to them why grandma didn't leave them any property? You can say it's Montana law, but they're looking at it saying, didn't grandma love me like she loved the rest? Eh, you don't want to do that. Well, and then this is why these others receive the great grandchildren one ninth. So a third of a third is one ninth. So congratulations to the person that got it right. Now, if this child over here, remember the turquoise child, if that child happened to be under age 18, Montana requires if the child inherits more than $5,000 that a conservator be appointed by the court. Now, who do you think would be the conservator? Well, most of you would probably say the wife. And you see, if there's some reason you don't care for the wife if you feel she would waste the money of the kid or some other kinds of things, then grandma could have done some estate planning and say, I want the property to go into a trust for this grandchild. And then she could have appointed her son or the kid's uncle as the trustee to protect the money for him. So there's some planning benefits, that's for sure but let's hope the wife is fine and she gets appointed as conservator. But the catch is at age 18, the kid can come and say, it's all mine. Well, at age 18, now remember how you were, you were probably like me, very mature. Uh-huh. But there are kids that aren't mature at 18. And that would be another reason to go with a trust and a trustee instead of the conservatorship through the courts. So grandma, on the other hand, may have decided what she wants to do is leave her estate to her favorite nonprofit. And oh my goodness, guess who it is? It's the Missoula Community Foundation. Yay. Okay, so a tip from the bitter root. Uh, decide if you want that right of representation to apply in their family. Now, some of you out there may already have a will and you're thinking, ah, uh, I didn't even need to listen to that part. But look at your will. Does it say that your property is going to be distributed by right of representation? And if it does, you've got the same situation as Montana law. And that may be fine. You know, it's up to you to decide where you want that property to go. Now, here we have a larkspur. And my goodness, I was doing this at a public meeting before COVID. And I had a lady in the meeting that said, you know, I really shouldn't be using that flower. And I go, well, why not? I think it's really cool. Well, she said, don't you know, it's a larkspur and all larkspurs are toxic. And I go, okay because it would explain toxic family relationships that can occur. So let's look at the Larkspur family and see how we can arrive at some of these toxic relationships. Well, here is the family. We've got mom and dad. And mom and dad, in this case, have five kids. Okay, And then those kids have grandkids. Or no, they have kids, which are grandparents to the mom and dad. 
Now, this case, I'm going to look at the brother. And he's a bachelor brother. So he's not married. He doesn't have children. And he passed away in 2020. So my question is, bachelor brother dies. Who has priority to inherit his assets? So is it mom and dad? Is it the sisters and brothers? Or is, are they the, the nieces and nephews? So enter the answer in the chat room real quickly and let's see what response you have. So Marcy, you can read those to me once you get a couple of those responses. Do we have anything in the chat room? Nobody's answered in the chat room? Nobody has answered in the chat room. Can I take a guess? You could take a guess. I Thank you. Oh, we do have, we have parents. Two for parents. Two for uh, parents. I was, I was gonna guess parents too. Okay, and that's very good. And that really wasn't that difficult, I suppose. But that's very good. You did take the time to say mom and dad are going to share equally. And then, of course, if it's only one parent, then that parent receives all. Okay, now let's say that the brother dies and mom and dad are gone. Uh, which group now has priority, the siblings or the nieces and nephews? Enter that very quickly in the chat. Okay, Marcy, you can guess. Yeah, everybody is writing siblings. Siblings. Okay, I got to get some more difficult questions for you. <laughs> yes, that is true. It's going to be a fourth, a fourth, a fourth. Because you see, this is equal. Montana gives it equal to the siblings in this situation. But now let's take it one step further and see what the condition is here. Well, what happens is I'm taking the real life situation and saying bachelor brother is the last one to die. Okay, we had a sister that passed away in 2001. We had another sister that passed away in 2005 and mom and dad were already gone. So the brother lives the longest. And what we want to know then is he's got a substantial ranch. We wanna know how is, well, I want to know that brother that has the red lightning bolt, what fraction, if any, would he receive? So you can guess all, one half, one fourth, or nothing. You know, it could be that all passes to the state of Montana because bachelor brother did not have a will. So let me know, is it all one half? or one fourth or nothing because he didn't have a will. Okay, we got responses from half of you. That's good, but we're running neck and neck. I'll just give you the warning. So what we need to see is the rest of you jump in there, don't hesitate. Okay, I'm going to share the results here and look at that. A th we've got a third, a third, and a third, but nobody selected the last one, which that is uh, good. Whoops. There we go. So let's see what the answer is. It is one fourth. And the reason I ask this question is to see how good of a teacher I am. And I'm a little disappointed in myself because if I'd have been really good explaining to you about right of representation, you would have known that it was a fourth. Because you see, it's just like the parents. The brother had how many brothers and sisters? Four, right. So that means each one was going to receive a fourth. So we've got this one sister's share goes down to the niece. Well, this is a niece that left Montana 20 years ago. She moved to New York City. She doesn't want anything to do with her Montana Hicks. 
And then we have the other sister who had two nephews. And in this case, they receive an eighth because they're splitting the fourth. And then we've got the two brothers that receive a fourth each. Now, the sad thing for me is I know this uncle had no respect for his nieces and nephews. I mean, one of these nephews here, because of right of representation, receives an eighth. And he was in prison. The other one, well, let's not go there because you might identify the family. So it's just another example where, gee, if I could have got to the uh, bachelor brother, shown him this drawing, and maybe he would have seen the need to write a will because I know he had no respect for the nieces and nephews. And you may know somebody in your family the same way. Otherwise, also the brother could have written uh, a will and maybe he didn't want to leave it to anybody except the Missoula Community Foundation. Now, I could say they were paying me to say this, but that's not true at all. Not true at all. Okay. Now, Marcy, uh, exactly how can a person leave a bequest to not the Montana? Ick! It's the Missoula Community Foundation. So mark that out and tell us about it. Yeah. So really leaving something to us in your will, and people do it for a variety of different re reasons, is really just putting the simple statement into your will. Um, I give the Missoula Community Foundation, a Montana nonprofit corporation located at 508 East Broadway. And then you also, we move to the next slide. Uh, our tax ID number is really important um, for the state piece and its successor organization, the sum of X, or it could be a percentage of your will. Um, some people create um, funds and we call them deferred funds and they could be deferred field of interest or deferred um, designated funds with us that their, um, their bequest will um, create basically. And so you could create a fund with us and it could say that I am gonna um, start a fund at Missoula Community Foundation and it's gonna give um, money to Five Valley's Land Trust. And um, that would be a designated fund. You could also start a fund that maybe is the, um, uh, you know, Jim Bennett Family Fund and it's gonna give to three different organizations. Um, and we would divvy that up proportionally. Um, you could also start a field of interest fund. So maybe you're really into the arts or maybe you really wanna focus on um, early childhood education. Um, maybe you want to focus on the environment. Um, so we could also establish a, a field of interest fund that would grant money out to those things well into the future. Um, some donors like to just use the community foundation as a way to pass money to uh, to take care of their philanthropic interest in their estate plan so you could establish a, a pass-through fund agreement with us and you could name as many organizations as you want and then your will simply says we leave this percent to the missoula community foundation and then the fund agreement with us allows you to have a lot of flexibility in the future as you might change your mind let's say some organization that you named no longer is sending you thank you cards and you don't like the new executive director. You could take them out easily. Or let's say um, your wife passed away last year and um, Hospice of Missoula took care of her and you want to leave something to them. You could easily add that instead of going back and paying for your will or estate plan to be changed. Um, so we have several donors that do that. And I just send out the list of who they intend to give funds to annually and say, is this still your intention? And we can easily update it as they need. So. Oh, okay. Well, that's really great to kind of have an idea. And I think if you go to any attorney uh, anywhere, uh, they would know uh, how to go about writing up the information to include in your will. So your wishes can be honored. Now, let's take a look here at uh, the, you know, decide if you want right of representation to pass your property uh, as far as that goes. And then let's avoid toxic family relationships. Now, I guess if you were to look at these flowers, I know when I was doing live programming, people would say, oh, those are daisies. 
No, they're not. They're white mule's ears. And uh, I don't know if you've heard this phrase that mom or dad is stubborn as a mule. Well, yeah, I know I've said that a couple of times about my dad. But what we want to do is really look at the consequences, which could be good or bad, of dad being stubborn as a mule. So what do I mean by that? Well, we're looking at this dad. And uh, the year is 2010. The property is all in his name because the wife had passed away several years ago. And so here's dad and he's saying, you know, I see no sense going to an attorney and paying that attorney a lot of money, write a will to leave it to my two children when I know the state of Montana is going to give it to my two children equally. You know, and he's quite right about that because under the law of interstate secession, the property will pass equally. However, I'm sitting in my office and I get a phone call from one of the kids. And the kid's just saying, the kid is saying, we want you to talk to our dad. And I go, okay, well, tell me more. So they did, and they have a concern. What if dad ma marries the wow wow floozy from Billings? Yep, there she is. Uh, and he puts the property in joint tenancy with right of survivorship with her. Okay, and I said, well, you've been to one of my programs. That's why you called. And the law says joint tenancy with right of survivorship is going to pass to the new wife. Well, okay, but dad tells the kids, don't worry, I've written a will. And the will is dated after that joint tenancy was established. So therefore, you boys are gonna get the ranch. So let's say that dad dies, okay? And I'm calling dad the mule just for fun. Um, do dad's kids get the ranch? So you can enter yes or no in the chat room because I can't hear you saying yes or no. So real quickly say, type in yes, type in no, okay? Do dad's kids get the ranch? So far, we have only half the ranch, question mark, and yes. Okay, while they're doing that, I'm going to show you uh, an item. And I'm going to say that the person who can guess what my item is on my neck, uh, I will send a wildflower card. So enter in the chat room uh, what you think this is uh, around my neck. I hope people see uh, the animal that happens to be there. Okay, Marcy, what do we got here? More yeses or more noes? We, nothing additional right now. Okay, well, the answer oh. is no. Oh. Dad's kids do not get the ranch. You see, what we have here is a contract, a joint tenancy with right of survivorship. And when dad dies, the surviving joint tenant receives it regardless of who that is. So in this case, the kids had a right to be concerned because what are they going to get? Zero of the ranch. So dad is stubborn of his, as a mule, refusing to go to the attorney, not realizing. Now, I couldn't exactly call up the, the, the dad because the kids want me to. I could say, I'm going to do a meeting in Billings, bring him there, or I'm going to do a meeting in Missoula, bring him to that, and I'll make it clear. But I just, as a, you know, an employee of Montana State University, can't call up someone and say, well, your kids uh, told me, blah, blah, blah. And not only that, I should tell you, I'm an educator with Montana State University. I'm an extension family economics specialist. And I'm not, an, I'm, I'm not an attorney. I've been studying this uh, information for many years, I will co confess, but I can't give you legal advice. What I can do is educate you. Now, let's say that uh, the new wife, you know, she's got the property. And would you believe she passes away without writing a will? Now, who inherits the property? 
Well, you're saying, of course, that's an easy question. It's going to be her kids. Okay, you're his kids. How do you feel now that these other two kids got your ranch? Oh, this is, see, this is not what families want to have happen. They need to realize the consequences of their actions. And we could even take another scenario here and worry that the, the spouse didn't die, but she married the good looking hunk in Missoula. Uh-oh, we got a problem. Yep, and guess what she did? She put the property in joint tenancy with the new husband. She died. Now who receives the property? Uh -huh, you've got that figured as well. It is the husband. So you see, this father and his new wife and things can happen, but he disinherited his kids unintentionally and she unintentionally disinherited her kids. So we have to be careful about how we're titling property and what the, the consequence of that is. It's not to say that joint tenancy is bad, but it's to say, if you have children from a prior marriage, you could end up disinheriting. So it could be not the best choice if you want to provide for those children from a prior marriage. So that's the tip from the mules here. Now, this is a showy Jacob's Ladder. It's the first time, you are the first audience to see this one. Uh, it was really exciting to go through some of my old slides and find out that, oh, 2016, I had this one and it turned out pretty good. So of course, I want to share with you the Jacob's family. So we've got here spouse, Jacob's parents, and the children of Jacob and the surviving spouse. So this is kind of what it looks like. You know, I can read this kind of stuff, but when I have a photograph, well, photograph, a drawing, it helps me see what's happening. So here we go. We've got a husband who has passed away. He's the black one. Anytime you see black, it means they've died. And then we've got his wife. We've got his mom and dad. And the property was all in the husband's name. I'm going to say he's one of my traditional Montana dads. And would you believe 87% of Montana farm ranch lands are in sole ownership. I couldn't believe it when I saw that statistic. Sure, there's a lot of corporations and things out there, but they have a lot of land, but it doesn't mean that we have that many of them. So we wanna know what fraction of any will each of Jacob's children receive of that $800,000, let's say. Is it a sixth, a third, a fifth, or nothing? We've got the poll up there. So if you will share what you think the answer is, that'd be great. Well, I've got one saying a third. I've got one saying nothing. And then we have, now two are saying nothing, that's good. Okay, it looks like two out of seven, or two out of three, we'll put it that way, are saying nothing. So let's, uh, we've got the nothing business. So what I'm gonna do is show you the answer all to the surviving spouse. Yes, in this instance, you see the children do not receive anything. And our law is so different than the states in the South. I just listened to a webinar before I started this where they were showing in a situation like this, the wife would get one fourth and the kids would each get one fourth. Oh my, that is not really recognizing the spouse when you give such a small amount like that. On the other hand, people could say, well, Montana is kind of nuts if they're going to give it all to the spouse. Well, it used to be one third to the spouse and then two thirds to the children. So if you tried to convince grandma and grandpa about this, they may disagree with you because they remember the old law, not what the new law says.
So the concern there is, well, what if she remarries and she puts the property in joint tenancy with the new spouse? Gee, have we provided for the children from this marriage? So the tip from the Jacob's Ladder is just consider what could happen if, and that could be either way. You know, you know, if the property's in joint tenancy between husband and wife, uh, think about that. It all goes to the surviving spouse, and then what? She could remarry. So those are the issues that we need to consider. Now, I gotta confess, when I was in Yellowstone National Park, you know, every summer looking for flowers, and I saw this one. And I thought, you know, it's really sad. This poor flower is sick. <laughs> well, what I didn't know is that I had discovered an albino fairy slipper. And this is what the fairy slipper typically looks like. It was healthy. It was beautiful. But of course, I had to figure out a way to get it in my presentation. So guess what? We have a married couple with property and sole ownership. And their last name is Albino. Okay, so we got John and Mary. And what they did was tell friends they wish to leave their property to the Missoula Community Foundation. So everybody knew what they wanted to do. But John, again, he's one of my traditional uh, Montana dads, and he's got all of his property in his name. So they don't have children. Neither one has written a will because they're saying, you know, well, if one of us dies, the other receives it. Well, okay, let's take a look at that. Let's say that we have a situation here with a car accident out there on the interstate. And John Albino dies immediately as a result of the wreck. And Mary Albino dies three days later. So what we want to know, there's no will, no kids. How is that property going to be divided? Who's going to receive the property that was John and Mary Albino's? Is it John's relatives, Mary's relatives, half to John's, half to Mary's, or I have the Montana 4-H Foundation there, but I should have had the Missoula Community Foundation. Marsha, Marsha. So pretend the last one is the Missoula Community Foundation. Okay, we've got Mary's relatives. And I bet that you're thinking when you said Mary's relatives is she lasted the longest. Okay, and that's your theory for why she would receive it. On the other hand, I see that we have a couple that have said John's relatives. Okay, well, let's end that poll then and share the results. We see the majority of you are saying John's and the other is Mary's. So what we're going to do is look and see what the answer is. It's going to be John's relatives. Now you're saying, well, of course it'd be that way. It's because the property was in John's name. Well, that's one factor. But the other factor is an heir must survive 120 hours or five days to inherit the property. So let me say that again, an heir must survive five days. So you see in this case, what was happening is Mary is actually treated as predeceasing John and it's because she didn't meet that survival requirement. So John, this is a couple I'm really trying to convince to write a will and John is, well, I told you, you know, we don't need it, it's gonna go to my relatives. And I'm thinking you better, I'm gonna get you yet. And what I did was change the example. And I said, John, you die first. And let's assume that Mary survives six days and then she passes away. Now, who is going to receive the property? And he looks at me and he goes, oh my gosh. You mean Mary's relatives would get all of this that I have worked for and my relatives don't get anything? And I said, mm-hmm. So if you write a will though, you can control where that property is going to go. So that's what he needed to think. They need to be proactive. 
they need to communicate with one another what they want to have happen. And then they each need to write the their, will, their separate wills. Let's not have any of this one will for both business. Attorneys should know better. There's, they're taught at law school. Don't do that anymore. Have two separate wills, okay? And then they can leave it to the Montana Community Foundation. Now, here we have, people thought it was a sunflower, but it's an old man of the mountain. Yeah, that's the name of this, this flower. And, you know, that reminds me of the misperception that estate planning is only for old people. If you've got white hair, you need to do estate planning. Well, here, believe it or not, we have a youth on age flower. Yep, I'd never heard of it before. Took a photograph in Washington, looked it up in the book, and ah, oh, youth of age. So it works well because the challenge is with the youth. Um, they think they're invincible. They think they're not going to die. And what do we got? Automobile accidents, farm ranch accidents, cancer. Uh, in, in Bozeman, we've had rock climbers die. We've had skydiving. And now we've got COVID-19 and the Delta virus to contend with. So death can occur at any age. So what can we do? Well, to get people to do some estate planning, one of the things is to do a what if. What if you die without writing a will? So what we did was come up with a website and we call it interactive because it gives you a chance to click on yes or no. And if you've got a grandparent in the family, this would be a good thing. Don't expect them to use the computer. That, that might be, depending on grandma and grandpa, too threatening. So just pull them in and show them. And what you will do then is answer the questions. So you could show yourself first and then take an example of grandma and grandpa if they don't have a will. So we go through, we ask people questions. Do you have living children? Uh, one or more living children from living children. I mean, you know, you can answer those. And then the very last screen, after you've answered all these questions, comes up to say, yes, this is how your property is going to be divided. So in this case, with the example, is a son would receive a third, a third. And then in this case, the grandchildren would receive one sixth because that is half of a third. We have in this uh, website 13 single family situations and 22 married situations. And we do that because we get situations like this. You know, you've got his kids, you've got her kids, you've got their kids. Well, how is the property going to be divided? And it changes when Montana legislature meets oftentimes, not every time, but it does. And so we have updated the website to reflect the most recent situations. Now, if you can't find your family situation in there, you need to email me and show me a drawing like this, and we'll see if we can get one in there that meets your needs as well. So this is the website. Um, and you can just enter Dying Without a Will in Montana and boom, this particular website will come up on your browser. So Dying Without a Will. Oh, and those of you that don't have good, reliable internet service, uh, we've got a CD as well. So you could request that CD. There's no music with it. It just does the same thing as the website does. So if you want to have a CD, just email me and we'd be glad to provide one for you. So the tip from the youth on age and the old man of the mountain is if you don't have a will or trust, use our MSU Extension website to find out where the property is going to pass, okay? Now, as I look at the clock, I can see that the time has been going by very quickly. And I'm hoping that we've got some questions in the chat room. So I'll say, you know, time has slipped away. Get it? And this was around Missoula, out there in uh, Rattlesnake Canyon, my very first uh, lady slipper that I saw. And I hope I did steer you to an awareness of Montana's plan for the transfer of your property after you pass away. And if you don't have a memory like this elephant's head, 
Now tell me, you can see the elephant, elephant ears right there. Elephant nose. Yeah, cool name. If you don't have a memory like the elephant's head, don't forget. So of course, these are forget-me-nots. But Montana State University Extension has 48 different Mont guides. These are fact sheets. And the fact sheets are on a wide variety of topics. And the vast majority of them are specific to Montana law. Uh, I have the business estates, tax, trusts, and real property section members review those Mont guides for legal accuracy. You know, I, I try to write them in a way we can understand, but I want to assure that they are legally correct so that you can depend on that information. You can read that information and you can have a really good background before you go to the attorney. And what the attorneys tell me is they can always tell people who have reviewed the Mont guys because, you know, he, he doesn't have to charge them $300 an hour to explain what I explained to you. Sure, there's reasons to have the attorney to handle the legal stuff, but you need to go in informed. And that's why I consider myself your taxpayer dollars at work, because you can then learn before you get to there. We also have your Missoula County Extension Office. I don't know how many of you know Kelly Moore. But she couldn't be on today because she's working with a support group. And then she has a dementia friendly committee meeting after that. So Kelly is the person to contact there at your local Missoula service. So what questions do we have? I will stop sharing and have um, Marcy tell me what questions are there and I'll see if I can answer those. Hi, Marcia. Thank you. Um, that was great. I love all your examples. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, somebody asked, uh, how often should we update? Um, how often should you update your estate plan? Uh, we suggest taking a look at first what kind of things have happened in the family. If you had some marriages, some deaths, some divorce, might you know look at it but you know i've kind of gotten to the feeling that it wouldn't hurt i had a specialist back in kansas and she said every couple should have a financial contingency day and i said what is that and she said it's just a time where husband and wife sit down and they read the wills because you know if you haven't looked at it for five years it's hard to remember what's in there I even did one three years ago and I go, okay, what did I say? About? I better check. So I think a financial contingency day every year would be good. Just take it out, you know, keep a copy at home, put the original in a safe deposit box if you want to, and just take a look at that. And it's a good time to look over your financial goals. You know, where do we stand? Are we getting ready for retirement? What's going on? And it can be very specific to that couple. So that's something I encourage people to do. Thanks. Um, another question is, um, how should young people word their wills if they're unmarried, if they have no kids, their parents are fairly old, they don't have a lot of money? Do you um, have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and, and we say that, you know, when we're younger, oh, we don't have a lot of money. And I remember those days, believe it or not. And you think, well, why, why do that? Well, at the same time, what we've got is, even if you've got $1,000, I dare say you have strong feelings about whether where you want that to go. Maybe because the parents are elderly and they're financially fit, they're okay, you don't want to leave it to them. Maybe you've got um, a family member that has uh, Down syndrome, and you would say, well, I'd like to establish a special needs trust for that child. And they could inherit the money, but it wouldn't disqualify them to receive Medi Medicaid or other programs like living in a group home or something like that. On the other hand, you may decide, hey, I want, I want to, I was a four ager. And what I want to do is recognize the Missoula uh, 4-H program. So you could leave what little you have to the 4-H foundation. But it's really up to you as a couple to talk about that. Because, you know, that's where you discover maybe you have different values about what little you have and where it's going to go. 
So have that discussion, reach a decision, and then he writes a will, she writes a will, and that will then take care of where the property is distributed. Yeah. One thing I always um, amazes me is the people's ability to give so much more significantly during after their passing and their estate um, versus maybe during their lifetime. And we had a nonprofit this past year, or actually it was 2020, that said, you know, we received this gift that we weren't expecting from an estate. It wasn't huge. It was like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, but it kept their doors open during COVID. And um, that donor, you know, had been giving to them for years, but they didn't know that there was something left in their estate. And so even giving, you know, five, three, $2,000 can make a big difference to a local nonprofit that you care about. Yeah, and it's a really great, great way to recognize, you know, I think about people that uh, have surprised communities with a large gift, uh, and they remember growing up there, uh, and they want to recognize the community and what the community did for them. And that's where I think, well, a local foundation could also be another way. And uh, I thought I'd ask, um, Marcy, do you, does the Montana Community Foundation hold any funds for another organization where you just manage them for them because they don't, they're not big enough? Um. Well, so we fiscally sponsor some organizations. That oh, don't okay, their, that's the word. They're 501c3. Yeah. Um, and we, um, you know, we have some designated funds that give directly to okay. nonprofits. Yeah. And yeah, that's good. Annual, because it, annual distribution, yeah. Yeah, and there, there are a lot of things to know about establishing, uh, you know, a foundation. And I've had some people want to do something on their own, but really you need to have a few bucks to spend the money to establish one and then you know if you don't follow the rules you're just gonna ugh, run into some tr there's trouble there's a lot of it there's a lot of startup and administrative costs to a family foundation and we actually just i did a webinar last week on the difference between maybe setting up a fund like a donor advice fund for your family to give from mm -hmm. versus a private family foundation and sometimes if we're not talking about 10 million dollars plus you know, a donor advised fund functions could serve the same function as a family foundation. Yeah. Now, see, I should have attended that uh, webinar that you had and educate me in, in the foundation area. Well, you can watch it on our YouTube channel, Marcia. Oh, okay. Yeah. I have to do that. Great. Yeah. Thank I, you. I, I do have one more question. Okay. Um, does a prenup affect the way that pro property would be distributed in Montana without a will? It certainly would. Uh, when you have a prenuptial agreement, uh, it is a contract, and that contract will be honored. Now, there's always an exception to the rule. See, the idea is if you have a premarital agreement, we've got uh, him, we got her, and they both need to have their attorneys, okay? Because one attorney has a conflict of interest with the other. You're supposed to be representing your client. So my hope is that premarital agreement, both parties had legal advice because when one dies, the other one come, come up and say, you know, well, he had me sign this right before I went out to uh, be a part of the wedding type of thing. And so we want to make sure, you know, there is that um, representation for both. And that contract then will override uh, what, and sometimes the contract will say, this is the way it's going to be for 10 years. And then if we're married longer than that, then we're going to divide it. You know, the will would have control, but the will won't override the contract of the premarital agreement. And we do have a Mont guide, of course, on that topic. And basically it's not legal advice, but it certainly tells you some of the things to consider when you're thinking about getting married. And we used to think it was only the rich people that needed to do that. Well, no, we have so many remarriages that it's a good idea. And if nothing else, it helps you sit down and talk about some issues that maybe you haven't thought about yet. So take a look at that Mon guide. Premarital yeah. agreements is the name of it. And I just want to thank everyone for coming and attending. And um, Marsha, thank you so much for your time and expertise that you provided.